Okay, on to part two of the chapter Physalia Physalis. Very fascinating so far. Just that first impression of Herod's sail is already really driving a picture into my head. Um, Anthony Horowitz has used fantastic language to get us there. That description of Herod's sail being so short you feel like he's in one of those funfair mirrors, you know, the distorting mirrors. I've just got this magnificent image of him. And the fact that he feels the need to have this giant jellyfish he fascinates me. Right, again, I'm waffling. Let's get on with the story. The Portuguese man of war. Sale continued. He had a heavy accent brought with him from the Beirut marketplace. It's beautiful, don't you think? I wouldn't keep one as a pet, Alex said. I came upon this one when I was diving in the South China Sea. Sale gestured, gestured at a glass display case, and Alex noticed three harpoon guns and a collection of knives resting in velvet slots. I love to kill fish, Sale went on, but when I saw this specimen of Fistalia Fisalis, I knew I had to capture it and keep it. You see, it reminds me of myself. It's 99% water. It has no brain, no guts, and no anus. Alex had dredged up the fact from somewhere and spoken them before he knew what he was doing. Damn, I thought it was Sale talking. I should have done that in Alex's voice. So what happens when it's live, gang? Sale glanced at him, then turned back to the creature hovering over him in its tank. It's an outsider, he said. It drifts on its own, ignored by the other fish. It is silent, and yet it demands respect. You see... The nematocysts, Mr Lester, the stinging cells, if you were to find yourself wrapped in those, it would be an exquisite death. Call me Alex, Alex said. He'd meant to say Felix, oh no Alex, but somehow it had slipped out. It was the most stupid, the most amateurist mistake he could have made. But he had been thrown by the way Sale had appeared and by the slow hypnotic dance of the jellyfish. The grey eyes squirmed. I thought your name was Felix. M my, my friends call me Alex. Or could save Alex. Why? After Alex Ferguson. I'm a big fan of Manchester United and he was the best manager they ever had. It was the first thing Alex could think of. But he'd seen a football poster in Felix Lester's bedroom and knew that at least he'd chosen the right team. Sale smiled. That's most amusing. Alex, it shall be. And I hope we will be friends, Alex. You're a very lucky boy. You won the competition, and you are going to be the first teenager to try out my Stormbreaker. But this is also lucky, I think, for me. I want to know what you think of it. I want you to tell me what you like, what you don't. The eyes dipped away, and suddenly he was businesslike. We have only three days until the launch. He said, we'd better get a bloody move on, as my father used to say. I'll have my man take you to your room and something, and tomorrow morning, first thing, you must get to work. There's a maths programme you should try. Also languages. All the software was developed here at Cell Enterprises. Of course, we've talked to children. We've gone to teachers, to education experts. But you, my dear Alex, you'll be worth more to me than all of them put together. As he talked... Cell had become more and more animated, carried away by his own enthusiasm. He had become a completely different man. Alex had to admit that he'd taken an immediate dislike to Herod Sale. No wonder Blunt and the people at MI6 mistrusted him. But now he was forced to think again. He was standing opposite one of the richest men in England. A man who had decided out of the goodness of his heart to give a huge gift to British schools. Just because he was small and slimy, that didn't necessarily make him an enemy. Perhaps Blunt was wrong after all. Ah, here's my man now, Sale said. And about bloody time. The door had opened and a man had come in, dressed in the black suit and tails of an old-fashioned butler. He was as tall and thin as his master was short and round, with a thatch of ginger hair above a face so pale it was almost paper white. From a distance it had looked as if he was smiling, 
But as he drew closer, Alex gasped. This man had two horrendous scars, one on each side of his mouth, twisting up all the way to his ears. I know what that reminds me of, the Joker. It was as if someone had attempted to cut his face in half. The scars were a gruesome shade of mauve. If you're not familiar, mauve was a 90s word for purple. It's still used, but purple, it's a diff slightly different to purple, but purple has kind of predom been predominant. There was a mauve class in my primary school, fun fact. There were smaller, fainter scars where his cheeks had once been stitched. This, I can't like this bit. This is Mr. Grin, Sale said. He changed his name after his accident. Accident? Alex found it hard to stare at his terrible wounds. Mr. Grin used to work in a circus. It was a novelty knife throwing act. For the climax, he used to catch a spinning knife between his teeth. But then one night, his elderly mother came to see the show. She waved to him from the front row and he got his timing wrong. He's worked for me for a dozen years now, and although his appearance may be displeasing, he is loyal and efficient. Don't try to talk with him. By the way, he has no tongue. Ugh, Mr Grin said. Nice to meet you, Alex muttered. Take him to the blue room, Sale commanded. He turned to Alex. You're fortunate that one of our nicest rooms has come free, here in the house. We had a security man staying there, but he left us quite suddenly. Oh, why was that? Alex asked casually. I have no idea. One moment he was there, the next he was gone. Sale smiled again. I hope you won't do the same, Alex. Rah, Mr. Grin gestured at the door. And, leaving Herod Sale standing in front of his huge captive, Alex left the room. He was led along a passage past more works of art, up a staircase and along a wide corridor with thick wood panelled doors and chandeliers. Alex assumed that the main house was used for entertaining. Sale himself must live here, but the computers would be constructed in the modern buildings he had seen opposite the airstrip. Presumably, he will be taken there tomorrow. His room was at the far end. It was a large room with a four-poster bed and a window looking out on the fountain. Darkness had fallen and the water cascading ten metres through the air over a semi-naked statue that looked remarkably like Herod's sail was eerily illuminated by a dozen concealed lights. Next to the window was a table with an evening meal already laid out for him. Ham, cheese, salad. His bag was lying on his bed. He went over to it, a night sports bag, and examined it. When he had closed it up, he had inserted three hairs into the zip, trapping them in the metal teeth. They were no longer there. Alex opened the bag and went through it. Everything was exactly as it had been where he had packed. But he, had cert been, he was certain the sports bag had been ex expertly and methodically searched. He took out the Nintendo DS, inserted the Speed Wars cartridge and pressed the start button three times. At once the top screen lit up with a green rectangle, the same shape as the room. He lifted the Nintendo up and swung it around him, following the line of the walls. A red flashing dot suddenly appeared on the top screen. He walked forward holding the Nintendo in front of him. The dot flashed faster, more intensely. He had reached a picture hanging next to the bathroom, a squiggle of colours that looked suspiciously like a Picasso. He put the Nintendo down and carefully lifted the canvas off the wall. The bug was taped behind it. A black disc about the size of a ten pence piece. A b Alex looked at it for a minute, wondering why it was there. Security? Or was Sale such a control freak that he had to know what his guests were doing every minute of the day and night? Alex put the picture back. There was only one bug in the room. The bathroom was clean. He ate his dinner, showered and got ready for bed. As he passed the window, he noticed activity in the grounds near the fountain. There were lights shimmering out of the modern buildings. Three men, all dressed in white overalls, were driving towards the house in an open-top jeep. Two more men walked past. 
These were security guards, dressed in the same uniform as the man at the gate. They were both carrying semi-automatic machine guns. Not just a private army, but a well-armed one. He got into bed. The last person who had slept here had been his uncle, Ian Ryder. Had he seen something? Looking out of the window, had he heard something? What could have happened that meant he had to die? Sleep took a long time coming to the dead man's bed. Wow. Absolutely brilliant. I cannot wait till tomorrow's bit. I'm reading it with you, so I'm not going to read ahead. And I'm doing it. That's why I had a few ups and downs. It's so good sharing it with you. I'm going to put a few questions and thoughts in the description. See what you think, and we'll reconvene tomorrow at the same time for the next chapter. It's getting so juicy. Have a good evening. Well done on your first day at school. I'm really impressed, and I hope you all put a lot of effort into it. Catch you tomorrow. Keep active. Get out in that garden. And I will we'll see you in the morning, nine o'clock sharp, for Mr. Cole's daily message, number two. Bye-bye, and sleep well, my friends.